Hi. Uh, good evening. As the nice lady told you, my name is Janelle Riley, and thank you so much for joining us for the SAG conversation with actor, director, writer, all probably does craft services on his movies, <laughs> Kenneth Branagh. Uh, I think most of us first took notice in his Oscar-winning adaptation of Henry V in 1989. Since then, he's gone on to build a very impressive resume uh, in all fields. Uh, he can currently be seen on screens playing Sir Lawrence Olivier in My Week with Marilyn, a performance that has earned him SAG and Golden Globe nominations, and just two weeks ago earned him his fifth Academy Award nomination. <laughs> Please welcome Kenneth Branagh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, since you're such a great director, I'm a little mortified you had to cross behind me. That was not uh, good staging on our no, part. No, that's good. We're a little, a little short on the fourth stage here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to show off for a minute. I'm in a suit. I don't normally wear a suit. I'm in a suit because I was at the... Uh, Academy nominees luncheon today, which was uh, very nice. It was. It was very nice. Um, I'd been nominated before, but I'd never had a chance to go to the luncheon. I'd always been working. So this was a uh, very exciting time. It was like a kind of, well, I would imagine to be like a high school graduation, but it was like, it, was, it seemed only about as many as, as this uh, number of people. And everybody got their certificate. And everybody got called up to the stage, and uh, it was. I, I was, uh, you know, I was standing there. I had this sort of inane grin on my face, just <laughs> cheering. And I looked around, and everybody else had the same inane grin as well. So George Clooney was like that, Brad Pitt was like that, and Meryl Streep was like that, and everybody else from there were, I think, 180 nominees in total, and there were 150 of us were there. So, and actually, it was a reminder, you just, people say to me, does it get, you can ask a question in a minute, by the sure. way. Sorry. To, <laughs> uh, people, people say, I was so excited about it, I just wanted to share it. Um, people say, you know, does it get old? And I said, well, of course it doesn't get old. It's just, it's just thrilling. It's, it's very, very exciting. I can't tell you how exciting it is. So I'm 51 years old and just tickled pink that I was there today. <laughs> and it was exciting. And at SAG the other week, I was here for the SAG Awards. And, and it was the same thing, particularly, and this is tea, by the way, uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, particularly, and I'm not just saying it because you're, you're, we're all here and we're, and we're here, but I think um, the sort of camaraderie between actors in these situations is quite... Uh, is quite sort of particular, and uh, it, it's uh, you know across this award season, I've noticed the sort of distinctive atmosphere. SAG Awards was definitely a distinctive atmosphere, very unsurprisingly, but very positively and very beautifully uh, celebratory about actors. And today had that feeling of being divorced from some of the kind of um, uh, you know tensions or terrors of, of this award season was just purely about isn't it great that we were all lucky enough to be I in this group knowing that you know it, it doesn't happen that way every time so it's it's been a very 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 nice day <laughs> so <there you> go. <laughs> Well, that was actually all my questions, so <laughs> right, okay. uh, uh, <laughs> it was actually my first question. I wanted to hear about the nominees lunch, and just out of curiosity, has there been anyone in particular who's come up to praise your performance that has really caught you off guard? Um, well, it all catches you a bit off guard, I mean, but that happens, frankly, whoever comes up to you, if they come up to you, you're always surprised, you're always delighted. Um, people say, oh... People are probably always say, saying this to you all the time. No, they're not. Um, <laughs> and I, I, and I, can give, I can give you a whole batch of reviews that can tell you when they're saying quite the opposite kind of thing. Um, I remember Alan Rickman once giving an introduction to a film that he directed, and he was talking about the poor reception in England. And he said, and we went around the world, and we were showered, showered with adulation. And then we came back home, and we were showered with quite a different kind of material. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, no, it's never, it's always very nice. And today, it's such terrible bloody name dropping, but I feel a bit sort of kid in a candy shop about it. Uh, George Clooney I was having a natter with today, who I think has done wonderful work this year, an amazing effort as well to have directed as beautifully as he did Ides of March and gives a beautiful performance, and then that really exquisite performance in Descendants. And uh, so he was very nice about what we did in, in my week with Marilyn. It was also fun to be there with Michelle Williams, 
Um, just we just get on so well. It's a very natural thing. And a big thrill for me was uh, Janet McTeer, who you, you may have seen in Albert Nob. She's she's nominated as best supporting actress. She gives a, a beautiful performance in a film that I loved. I absolutely loved that movie. Um, well, Janet, I've known her since she was 17. We were at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art together. So I saw Janet McTeer. When you may know Janet, she's a very tall, very very beautiful, tall imposing, uh, wonderful actress. Um, and I remember, it's beautiful to see her there today. I remember her coming into RADA and being rather self-conscious about her height and um, it's kind of gangly. And, and, uh, and then I remember in the fifth term there, we all had to do a Greek play and she played um, uh, Clytemnestra in one, one of the East, part of the Aeschylus um, plays, um, uh, the Agam Agamemnon plays. And, uh, it required her to be, you know, a real, to really sort of come out of herself. And one really felt, I, I remember seeing back then when she was 18 thinking, oh, I think I've just seen a star happen. <laughs> um, this, this girl who was all gangly emerged as this kind of deverish, beautiful, powerful thing. So, so to see her there today was, that when you can squeeze somebody and say, you know, we knew each other when we were up in the green room at RADA, um, you know, all kind of starving and, you know, trying to borrow money to go and see a play that night in the West End <laughs> or something. Or all, do we all had odd jobs? We, we used to do things in the summer. I, was, uh, I used to clean, I used to clean the toilets in the uh, St. Martin's School of Art, which was near us, but it was a way of making a few bob and got you to the theatre. Anyway, it was lovely to see Janet McTeer today also, <laughs> <laughs> who did not clean toilets. I mean, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that. And how did you hear about your nomination this time around? Uh, I, was, uh, I was on the island, the Channel Island of Guernsey, where I was on a location scout for a film that I hope to make at some point uh, soon. And uh, uh, it was a text from our director, uh, Simon Curtis, who, who just said, uh, I'm so, so pleased for you. Uh, and I wondered what it was for a minute because we had lost, uh, I thought, what have I done? And then, and then uh, 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 I thought, hope it's something nice that he's pleased for me for. And then Judy Hoffman, my longtime manager from here, rang. And then, uh, and then I rang my wife. And so all of this was happening in the middle of a kind of uh, thunderstorm. The rain was kind of sideways at us and it was blowy and it was me and the design. It was weird. It was me and the designer and the producer and the, the usual gaggle of, it's funny, at that end of things, when you're doing a, a location scout, it's sometimes it's just you, then it's three people. And it's funny to think in this quiet place, in a little while, uh, 200 people will show up and, uh, and the circus will come to town, rather like My Week with Marilyn talks about. But, so it was, it was good news from friendly people in a windswept place. <laughs> uh, if we could go back to the beginning of your career, when did you realize you wanted to be an actor? Uh, I was 16, and I was in a school play, and uh, uh, I guess, I don't know how you all feel about this, about the business of advice and whether you ever encourage anyone to go into our profession. We all know how tough it is, you know, and uh, when I was thinking that perhaps it might be a good thing to do, I, I, looked at a, I looked at what the career service had by way of advice, <laughs> and uh, it was a piece of paper, I went through this, it was, a, it was about this size. Um, uh, for a huge school and in fact a huge town and it just began with the words an empty theatre is a lonely place <laughs> uh, and then it went on it was very gothic it went on about when the, when the laughter has stopped when the applause has faded you will see nothing but empty seats and you know if you look behind the tinsel glitter and all the rest of it, it was basically saying whatever it looks like it's terrible you'll never get a job they are basically saying you'll never get a job it quoted I think in England, 87% unemployment um, uh, for actors. And so my parents were pretty concerned about that. But anyway, a teacher in the school where I was doing a play at 16, I was doing a play called Oh, What a Lovely War, which you may know. It's an ensemble piece, lots of different parts for lots of different people. It's a beautiful, beautiful play about, uh, that is very anti-war. So it's about the First World War. And uh, I got a chance to show off and do different accents and things. And it all seemed great fun. I don't know how you know, seriously, I was doing anything, but I knew it was great fun. And a teacher said, you could do this professionally. And uh, it, it really was sort of startling, uh, because that seemed like going to the moon, the idea of becoming an actor. I mean, I didn't know, I just couldn't imagine, from my background, my dad was a, a joiner or carpenter, as you might say. My mum worked in the fish and chip shop around the corner. We were, you know, working class family, no connections to 
showbiz in any way, shape, or form. So I just didn't know what you would do with it. He said, and I said, well, how, how would you do that? He said, well, you'd probably go to drama school, and I, what's a drama school? And then in the days, because uh, I'm so ancient, in the days before, before the internet, that was a, so you'd go down to the library and find out about all of that. <laughs> And uh, I found out that there were places in London that were called drama schools, and, and so it all began. I mean, he really had, uh, the idea that he'd planted was so um, swift to kind of take root that um, from that point, really, I, I didn't want to do anything else. And as soon as I discovered a little bit about what it might involve and how difficult it would be to get, um, you know, an equity card to become a, an actor on stage, Oh, it was, it was, I was indefatigable. I, I just was, it was so clear that, that it was what I enjoyed doing so much. It made me so happy, so happy, still does. It makes me so happy to be an actor. Um, it's so interesting. It's, it's never, ever, didn't then, and never has ever felt like going to work. Um, that uh, I just knew that that's what, that's what I wanted to do. And it didn't matter to what degree I might do it, and I just thought if I can just at some point get some regular employment, that would be fine, and I'll practice it any other way. I had no other ambitions beyond trying to get a job. I thought if I could have a job as an actor, a professional actor, uh, I'd be absolutely made up. Um, there's nothing, nothing about, or nothing beyond that really, other than because it was already so strange. I thought it would just be wonderful, and it turned out to be. And you were accepted into the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, you I mentioned. Was, yeah. uh, what was the process like to get into that school? Uh, you had to send off your, uh, what was it, I think it was about six pounds, about twelve dollars back then for your, your audition registration fee, your non-returnable non fee. Um, for then you were sent something that said, please come and do a speech from Shakespeare and a speech from a modern play. And I did the uh, bastard speech from Edmund in King Lear, thou nature art my goddess to thy, uh, can't remember, think of the word, someone will remind me, uh, my services abound, etc., which I think had been done by more or less every other candidate, so the eyes glazed. <laughs> I'm going to do Edmund from King Lear. Uh, uh, and uh, I did, uh, and then I did a speech of Mix from The Caretaker, Harold Pinter's The Caretaker. Uh, one of his sort of uh, intimidating uh, um, Pinteresque uh, uh, speeches, and uh, I think that was also much done. I did that in the morning for two people. Um, th I got the audition date about three months before, and I don't think I slept uh, much before that. I was so excited to go up to London and, and not mess it up. I went in in the morning, and then in the afternoon they called you back, and, and so I auditioned in front of two people. There were a panel of people of auditioning. In the afternoon I auditioned before eight of them so that the rest of them had already been a kind of cull, and uh, we were brought back. And then the first sort of introduction to show business was at the, the top floor of RADA, and someone coming in, I don't know if you've all had experiences like this, where, and you don't, never know how to read it. They come into a room, and they read a group of names out, and you don't know whether those names are the ones leaving, <laughs> or they're the ones staying. And so everyone's sort of like that, you know, and other people are tragic. And then, and then they say, and all of you lot, you, yeah, you can go. And then everybody else, and that's actually what, what happened. They did it as, you know, as best they could. It's just a horribly ruthless thing. And then I had to go back, and, um, and, and uh, the principal of RADA, uh, Hugh Cropwell, who became a great mentor and was, worked on most of the films that I directed that I was in, uh, he wanted me to come back, and he felt he, he said uh, that he felt I was a performer and not an actor yet, and that I had to come back. And uh, in fact, I came back, and uh, he asked me to do the uh, Edmund speech, the very one I've just mentioned, but this time do it as do it as a punch drunk East End boxer. And uh, and so I didn't know, really know what he meant. I thought, well, I, you know, so I sort of went to the back of the room, and then I and then I came came forward and started doing this and said, "Thou nature art my goddess." To thy, and he said, he said, "No, no, no, that's the problem. That's what I'm talking. About. Indication, just indicate it. You know, I'm not saying do boxing movements. Just somehow take yourself to another. Think of you know, be somewhere else, different kind of person. It was an interior thing that he was talking about." But I did that, and I did, I did uh, the gentleman caller speech from the Glass Menagerie, um, and uh, and then and th then he offered me, they offered me a place, and then I had to, I don't know how it works here now, 
But back then, amazingly, there was a possibility that your entire education would be paid for by the government. And indeed, in my case, it was. So there was what was called a mandatory grant. If you got into university and did a degree, then because you'd paid your taxes, then you were there. And it was fees and maintenance were paid for the entire three years. Well, it was just reaching the point where that wasn't true of arts, arts vocational courses, because I got a diploma. It wasn't a, it wasn't a degree. So... It was seven terms, and I suppose it added up to about, you know, back then, a lot of money, about 6,000 quid, which is, you know, $10,000 or whatever. And um, I had to audition for my local council. Having got the place at RADA, I then had to audition with other people who were trying to get money for foundation courses, for, for you know, fine art courses, people who were in dance, people who were painting. So we all, we, I don't know how they ended up sort of trying to... Um, kind of present themselves in that way but I auditioned for them and then uh, six months later I in fact got all of that covered so and I certainly wouldn't have been able to go if I hadn't but all of my fees and all of all of the maintenance was paid for um, uh, as part of as it were what my parents had paid for in their taxes so that was amazing and about the last point at which that happened um, and indeed that you know isn't automatic now for anybody going to university in the UK either which is a great shame but anyway I was very very lucky that might have been the most important audition of your life, if you think about it. Yeah, it was, you didn't, again, you didn't know, it's a funny old thing about auditioning, isn't it? You, you um, hard to know uh, quite, you know, whether you, you're trying to show off, you're usually doing two pieces, and, you know, in the crudest terms, you're trying to do the flashy one and the subtle one, the loud one, the quiet one, the funny one, the dramatic one, and... Uh, you know, and often they all mel meld into one anyway, you know, because you think as you're doing it, I better show them I can do this as well. And then you end up just being loud. Um, what was he? Well, I could really hear him. Um, uh, so I guess I was, uh, I was uh, luck lucky and... Uh, what's that phrase? Are you just somehow you've got to find a way to just sort of be honest because they, they can smell fear. That's that line in broadcast news, isn't it? If only... If only desperate and needy were turn-ons. Um, uh, and unfortunately, they're not. So did you ever ask Hugh, um, if you gave that audition for him and you were indicating, how, but he knew you were an actor, not a performer. Did he know in that moment, or did he uh, think I, he could teach you? I'll tell you why he told me he thought I was an actor is because I started drying. I started losing my lines, uh, which I found very throwing. He said, that's it. That's all I needed to see. I said, well, you, all you needed to see was me forgetting the words. Uh, he said, no, that means you're in the moment. That means you are now not preparing. You are now open to this encounter. Uh, you, you're just, you are just reacting. And because you don't know what's happening and you don't quite know what the words are, you're not that familiar with them, uh, you are, uh, you're, you're in the moment. You're being real. So, um, and that was in itself was a kind of um, a shock to the system to sort of see it from that point of view. Um, so, yeah, that, that's why he believed that that uh, was evidence of me having that possibility, at least. So the next time you forget your lines, it just means you're an actor. I think it means, it can mean you're being, sometimes it means you didn't learn your lines. Sometimes, uh, but sometimes it means, yeah. It's an interesting thing, that, isn't it, about um, what, I mean, more and more and more I find myself interested in... Um, how difficult it is to give the impression as an actor of complete spontaneity and reality and naturalism, if that's what the style of the piece requires, if you even think about it in those terms, um, and how you can do that and get out of the way, how you really, really can speak, like, you know, like we're speaking now, as it were, and, not, and, and get the acting out of the way, whether it's Shakespeare or whether it's, uh, it's um, you know, a naturalistic thing. And, uh, yeah, on the way to that, sometimes, you know, forgetting it or appearing to forget it is, is a good thing. But anyway, it's all... I find it's more and more of a mystery the more I do it. But it's fascinating. And at Rotter, do they teach a specific method or is it like a combination of several ideas? The, the, the great thing about the training, as far as I was concerned, is that we were exposed to every kind of director. So, um... Uh, there was, um... To give you, this is a kind of broad example, but there's a kind of, we'd have a sort of Stanislavski type director. We did a production of Three Sisters where we spent nine weeks and we, uh, you've probably done all this, actioned every single word, you know, so if I come in and I say good morning, the action on the line has to be he welcomes Natasha. You have to have an absolute written out intention. It could be 
he hates Natasha. You're still saying good morning, but you, you register what this intention is. So you do that with the entire text. And we were very rigorous with that. In fact, by chance, I'm re I don't know why I'm doing it, but I, I know why I'm doing it. I'm rereading Stanislavski right now uh, um, because someone gave me a very nice edition of it. And of course, that it's so brilliant. It's so completely and utterly useful and practical and contemporary. So we had, amongst others, we had somebody, uh, a director, we, we, we were doing plays in front of an audience from the very second term that we were there. So we were very exposed to audiences. They believed that you needed to do it in front of people, that it wasn't so much. This is different from other drama schools in London who said, let's, uh, in broad terms, let's keep it inside, break you down, is what some people said for a, for a couple of years, and then we'll build you back up and we'll send you out into the world. And ours was the other way around, that it was exposure to different kinds of techniques. So we had that very extreme Stanislavski technique, and then the other end of it was people like uh, the woman who, on day one, we started doing this play, an English period play, and by the middle of the first afternoon, we, we, we'd kind of blocked it all out. I mean, nearly, nearly all of it was blocked out, you know, and, uh, which was a surprise to some actors, including one who said, um, had a bit of a tantrum in the, in, you know, or a moment in the middle of the first afternoon and we felt was being rushed and, you know, and just said, look, I just, you know, I, uh, I just, you know, we've done everything. I would just, I just, look, I, you know, I, just, I don't, I don't know where my, I don't know where I'm coming from. And there was a pause and then the director said, you're coming from upright, you're walking down to the <laughs> table here, then you're crossing over to the other, the other chair. Um, and so you had that, and then you had various people in between. We used to we had to do restoration comedy, we had to do Greek plays. We had a, a very, very wide-ranging thing, which I found very um, helpful. Um, and, uh, I mean, we still had lots of, um, you know, internal things. We had to do something called a standard English test, where you had to, as it were, have at your disposal a neutral tone of voice, a, a, um, a sort of newsreader English, as we might say, a sort of BBC English. Uh, it, that's to say you could have that at your disposal even if you were naturally speaking in a regional accent. Um, that used to be very sort of, you know, complicated and it made people feel they were being judged and everything. We had something called Stand Up and Entertain where you had to come and do two minutes in front of the rest of the academy. You just had to, you had to do something different. People would do songs, they'd write things, they'd do stand-up comedy. We did our stage fight evenings. We did something called the Tree Evening where the business was invited to see us do a couple of sort of showcase pieces and lots of things like that. All of it, quite a kind of uh, uh, microcosm of, of the, the business, full of knocks and falling down and getting ups, but uh, it was, I thought, really a, a good education for an actor. And how soon upon graduation did you start getting jobs in, in the industry? I got a job uh, through uh, the newspaper The Stage. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a, it's a um, uh, uh, the stage and television today it was called and uh, still uh, very much uh, alive and kicking. It's where uh, actors used to get a lot of work and there was an advert in my, just before I went to, to start my last term at RADA for uh, a television play with an actor who required a, 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 an authentic Belfast working class accent it said, who needed to be between 16 and 20 and uh, I, I it said, send, send your CV and your, and your photograph to uh, uh, an address in London. And uh, I only had one photograph, and it was on the, it was on the wall at, at RADA, where they had, to, they had to be. And I didn't even know CV. I mean, you know, I, so I, I, I made something up, I, like, like you do. It was a little, bit, a little economical with the truth about, uh, about all, all the parts that I'd played. Um, uh, and uh, I don't know, what you, whatever you add when you're 19 or 20 things that I'd liked seeing, you know, uh, pic pictures I'd enjoyed, that kind of thing. And then I, uh, I went up to, I was staying with my parents at the time, and I went up to London, I took the single photograph and the made-up CV across to this office at, at BBC Television Centre. And uh, to my amazement, they rang up the next day. Obviously, they had a very limited number of people they could see because, you know, it needed to be somebody young. Um, so I went in and eventually got the job, and, the, and uh, Rada let me, I was pulled out of a, they let me go do it for one month during my final term back in my hometown of Belfast. So, uh, strangely enough, I, pull, I was pulled out of a production of A Flea in Her Ear, Fado's A Flea in Her Ear, in which I was going to play the role of Etienne, the waiter, which was a role that Laurence Olivier played in a famous production of A Flea in Her Ear uh, at the National Theatre in, uh, in 1967. Yeah, so weird little wheels within wheels. Didn't you actually write Olivier while you were at RADA? You I had did. a communication with him? 
during that very production of Three Sisters in which I was actioning away to little effect um, because I was uh, sort of 45 years too young to play um, Che, 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 che Boutique in The Doctor. Uh, he's the one who sits on the bench at the end and sings ta ra ra boom di eh? as he, it's, oh, it's, it's w wonderful. He, he has a great scene in the third act where he smashes a clock um, and uh, gets across, gets drunk and uh, has that lovely line about you can say what you say what you like but loneliness is a terrible thing and uh, seems a harder to do when you're 19 when to sort of carry that bit of the weight of the play but but I, I basically you know I, I put some essentially put some flour in my hair and sort of pad it up a bit and tried did the bad bad old acting and just like I've yet to see an old per what's an old person anyway, but I've yet to see someone a senior person who does the kind of walking that I was doing which was completely out of my own uh, you know handbook of bad acting uh, techniques um, and so in the midst of uh, I remember just uh, you know walk, walking all night and standing in front of the mirror and looking at me doing my thing with my flower and everything and thinking this is so bad so bad <laughs> I'm going straight to the top so I wrote to Sir Laurence Olivier and said Gee, help me please was there anything that you listened to? Was there a piece of music? Was there a poem you read? Was there a film you saw? Was there anything that I could go and look at? And maybe I could get back to getting this interior that, I don't, that I'm missing by one million miles. I'm, frankly, I'm missing the exterior as well, but, <laughs> but, but, but it's not looking so bad next to the, the hollow shell of the interior. So I wrote to him and, and he said, there is nothing that I can tell you to, to help you with this. Uh, it's really something you have to find out for yourself. He said, but uh, my advice is to have a bash and hope for the best. Uh, which I certainly wish you. That's that's what he said. So, and actually, when it came to when it came to doing the the film, uh, I wrote it on a little note and put it at the top of my mirror, so I would see that piece of advice every day when I was being cheeky enough to try and be him. <laughs> uh, just out of curiosity, where did you get Lawrence Olivier's address? In the who's who of the theatre, of a volume <laughs> this this thick again from the library, and uh, and at the end it listed, you know. Uh, I, Habits, uh, enjoyments, pastimes, uh, London address. And he gives his London home address because that's what you did in this sort of old world of gentleman actors because no one's going to be as crass as to show up or write. Uh, <laughs> except uh, I didn't realize you put the address in, but you don't write to them, you know. But I did, you know. And but frankly, I'm sure that's why I got an answer because, uh, you know, not many people did. But it was, it, well, yeah, it was the, uh, at the end of, the, of this, you imagine his entry in Who's Who in the Theatre was like 12 pages, listed every play he'd ever been in, every part he'd ever played. Um, but at the end, another sort of old fashioned part of it was it listed the clubs to which he belonged, which is a very oldy worldy English actor thing, you know, belonging to the Garrick Club or the Savile Club or whatever. And weirdly, his, his home address, so that's, I've got it out of a book. Yeah. <laughs> that you found at a library, mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Uh, I know the, te the term big break is kind of a misnomer, but w what do you sort of consider your, your big break in the industry? Uh, well, that play, that television play, was, was a great, great part um, at a time when a new play written by a very fine Irish writer called Graham Reed was playing on primetime television in the middle of the week with just uh, three channels, four channels then, just four terrestrial channels. So you had a chance to be seen in something like that, a new piece of writing, you know, by a couple of million people, you know, because it was on the telly and, there, you know, that, there wasn't the competition of everything that there is now. So that was an enormous break. And then, to obviously, to get the chance to go to the Royal Shakespeare Company um, when I was, uh, I was only 23, and uh, to play Henry V was, was, was quite, quite something to, uh, um, to get the opportunity to audition for them, to even be thought about. Um, and just that, actually, that I remember auditioning on the stage of the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, uh, you know, 1,500 seats, and, uh, which goes all the way. It's very, very steep at the top. They've just rebuilt it, but it, very, and full of ghosts, full of, you know, uh, the home to many amazing performances, including many by... Uh, Sir Lawrence and Gielgud and that, that generation and, and then latterly by the Derek Jacobys and the Ian McKellens and the Judy Denches and so to be on that stage actually I remember it reminded me of that very careers 
uh, notebook or sheet of paper that said a theatre is an empty, uh, empty theatre is a lonely place. <laughs> I found it to be a very exciting place. So to be on an empty stage and just one guy out there, the director of Henry V, um, as it was going to turn out to be, um, and to be able to, you know, to just stand there and say, you know, once more onto the breach or whatever was pretty thrilling. I just thought, if nothing else, I'm standing where all those other people stood. How uh, it was pretty. I, I was. I've always was, and always have been affected by the sort of chills down the spine connection to all, all the others that do what we do, and um, so it was. It, that was an enormous break to go there and, and play that part. Did you do your Edmund monologue for the audition? <laughs> I did not. I think that I realised uh, that uh, if you run the Royal Shakespeare Company, you've probably seen that a few times. I think I did Lord Foppington from The Relapse. Uh, I don't know if you know that play uh, by Van Brer. Um, a very, very foppish character. So I decided I would just go for a very flamboyant... I think I used a handkerchief. I think I used props. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, went, I went for funny uh, for that one, the big funny bit. Uh, and then I did the, um, for them, I did the, uh, the Hotspur speech from uh, Henry IV. My liege, I did deny no prisoners, um, which I did. Again, it sounds, I'm enslaved to this guy, but I did it because uh, um, having a, a limited imagination then and now, I had read that... Uh, in playing that part, that Laurence Olivier, when he played Hotspur, had learnt that the character had a stutter, uh, historically had a stutter. And so he used it at various, um, at various points, including uh, at the very last line of Hotspur, as he speaks to uh, Prince Hal, soon to be Henry V, who's defeated him. Uh, uh, the line, I believe, someone will correct me, but I'm paraphrasing, he said, I, I, I will be food for worms, Harry. And he made Hotspur stutter on, on the W, so that it is very dying line, he said, I'm food for and, hot, and Prince Hal finishes it in a very nice touch. But it allowed me, when I did the uh, No Prisoners speech, to, uh, there was a line in it where he goes, my, my liege, I did deny No Prisoners, but I remember when the fight was done, when I was dry with rage and extreme toil, breathless and faint, leaning upon my sword, came there a certain lord, neat and trimly dressed, fresh as a bridegroom, and his chin new reap showed like stubble land at harvest home. Uh, for, uh, blah, 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 and he gets to the middle of it. Um, <laughs> He goes on forever, I can tell you, uh, about the fellow who's come and annoyed him. And the, the, the line in the middle goes, for he made me mad to see him shine so sweet and smell so like a waiting gentlewoman and talk of guns and drums and wounds, God save the mark. So it allowed me in the middle of that speech to go, for he made me mm, 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 mad to see him shine so brisk and smell, which was very effective for the audition. So I did that and Lord Foppington, and they gave me the part. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. And at this point, how familiar were you with Shakespeare? I mean, I'm sure you'd studied him at RADA, but had you done many of his plays? I had not. My first uh, Shakespeare was in an amateur production of Othello, in which I played the role of Cassio. Um, and uh, I enjoyed it very much. I had a, I had a, a sort of affinity for, for it. I mean, by which I mean I, I simply enjoyed it. I enjoyed reading it. I didn't always understand it. Still don't always understand it. <laughs> Uh, the first time I was exposed to it was in school, being asked to stand up and read uh, along with the rest of the class at various points, The Merchant of Venice, which really didn't make any sense to me at all. <laughs> and uh, I'm, not sure, I'm, still, I'm not sure it does now. I really am not sure it does now. But, uh, uh, and then I went to see a production of Romeo and Juliet, which was very exciting. I remember Juliet being very, very uh, appealing, and uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, and, uh, and then we had to study various plays. I remember we had to study uh, at school when I was between 16 and 18 doing what we call the A-levels, um, Much Ado About Nothing and Antony and Cleopatra. We went to see Antony and Cleopatra. I saw Glenda Jackson as Cleopatra in, in Stratford. And, um, and, and, and I think I saw Much Ado at that time. And, and in all the cases where there was a good production or even an indifferent production but with good actors, uh, I was very... I, I, I enjoyed very much when it came alive and when, as it were, it seemed like they were just making it up. And I was amazed by the way they did it and sometimes by what, uh, what appeared to be the naturalness of the writing. And a, a wonderful thrill for me when I played Benedict in Much Ado About Nothing on stage, um, which I did for about a year uh, in advance of the, uh, of the picture that we made. Um, and occasionally people would come around backstage and say that to me, that you've made some of it up, which was... 
Uh, hopefully a good night for me, but it was mostly, of course, the fact that Shakespeare, who wrote most of it in prose, wrote in this very, very still contemporary seeming way and yet with such intelligence and color that his writing prose was poetry in itself and if you did deliver it with if you just hit the spot it was very 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 beautiful um, so I, I always felt that about it I felt moved by it when it when it worked well and also perplexed by it when it didn't so I was especially I suppose coming from a and I don't mean this in any sort of martyrish way. There weren't any books in our house. My, my parents were both bright people, just didn't read books. They went to the library, and they read newspapers, and they read magazines, and we watched the telly. You know, it wasn't a, we weren't a great literary household. So, and we had a sort of slight working-class suspicion of um, uh, people who were cleverer than us. It was not suspicion, but somehow there was a sense of uh, uh, sometimes feeling that they were, they were smarter or there was something they knew that we didn't know. And so when it came to Shakespeare, when... Uh, when it really worked for me, I felt as though I wanted to share that with people like me who might otherwise feel excluded. They might feel they have to have gone to university to understand Shakespeare. Uh, not, not that there's anything wrong with that, but just that there was some secret other way of doing it other than whatever it might be, a lovely performance or a great... You, know, you read it and it speaks to you or some other connection with it. And it gave me a kind of um, passion to want to... Uh, you know, spread my, uh, share my kind of enthusiasm, and also my struggle to sometimes understand, you know, what he meant, and 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 what the plays meant, and also with how, with that sort of balance between one loves it on the one hand, and yet, frankly, I have seen it done so badly. I've been involved in doing it so badly sometimes that uh, when it doesn't work, it's so appalling. It is. It's like watching paint dry uh, when when you, you do. Bad production of Shakespeare makes you want to, you know, lose, you lose the will to live. In that. <laughs> and, and, when it, and when it works, it, it's sort of transcendent, you know. So, so, but somehow the difference, it seems so minuscule, but the results are uh, incredible. And, well, Jesus, I've put, you know, I've sent people to sleep uh, in the, in the theatre doing it. But, uh, and sometimes we, we, we've done better than that, yeah. Uh, the original Henry V was, well, not the original, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which I didn't see. I don't know. Uh, the, the one that you starred in was directed by Adrian Noble. Yes. How did you come to direct and star in a film version? <laughs> uh, sometimes I wake up in the night and I ask myself the same question. <laughs> I was running a theatre company. I came away from the Royal Shakespeare Company passionate about working in companies. I was very passionate about, about the family of a, of a, of a theatre company. And uh, I liked the, um, I loved the RSC in many ways, but the scale of it uh, made me feel sometimes that there was a kind of impersonal element. I wanted it just to be smaller. And that thing that we saw with the audiences simply enjoying an actor being, you know, in this play, in this part one night, and in a different play in another part, and enjoying that part of what actors do, the sort of chameleon side of it, I wanted to enshrine in a smaller way in our little company. And we took it on the road, and we, and we made it very much an actor's company. And these, uh, we, we'd, we'd done two or three plays to start the company's life off, which were uh, fairly disastrous. I wrote a play which six people saw called Public Enemy, and uh, <laughs> I put some money into it, lost all of it. Um, and then we did a play about the life of Napoleon by a brilliant uh, uh, solo performer called John Sessions. And then we started to get lucky. We did a production of Twelfth Night, which went well. And then we did this three-play season with plays Much Ado About Nothing directed by Judy Dench, uh, Hamlet, directed by Derek Jacobi, and As You Like It, directed by Geraldine McEwen, all of whom had been in these plays before, and it also felt to me that the character of the company could partly be about just passing on great actors, passing on their, their knowledge of uh, the plays and parts to, to younger actors, and, and some interchange going on that would be good. We toured with those plays. It was an amazing experience. Um, uh, but to be directed by uh, Judy Dench, who's uh, uh, well, all of them, you know, and, and Derek Jacobi to get notes on on on, on Hamlet from him, uh, which mostly, and he, he's one of my dearest friends, so he, I, I would say this if he was here. But he, mostly his direction consisted of getting up and saying, "Let me do it, let me do it for you." <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, no, not like that, not like that, no, 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 no. <laughs> to be or not to be. Um, okay, all right, I'll do it though. Um, uh, uh, or Judy Dench, bracingly frank in her appraisal, um, uh, uh, just coming round and, and saying, oh, Kenny, that was awful. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really was. It was awful. It was awful. 
But you know that, don't you? Uh, not, not, not so much, Dame Judy. Uh, um, but these plays were seen by a man called uh, Steve, Stephen Evans, who was a, uh, a freelance stockbroker who'd had several careers uh, 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 that had been successful and unsuccessful, and he was on a, on a high at this point, and he wanted to get into the film business or, or into the... Uh, you know the the world of the arts. A very intelligent fella and very uh, very culturally was very widely read and, and uh, went to movies and theatre and stuff. Anyway, he he rang up and I remember uh, um, uh, uh, someone said to me once, we'll "Always take all your calls for Christ's sake." This is an example. <laughs> I get a call where at the Riverside Studios in Hammersmith, we've had this disastrous play of mine. We're in the middle of a disastrous preview period for the Napoleon play. It's dying, dying, dying. Um, and the technical is a nightmare. It's just not my specialist area of knowledge. I'm directing it, but I don't really know what I'm doing. And I go to have a cup of coffee, and somebody who works behind the, the, uh, uh, the, the cafe says, there's a guy been calling for you called Stephen Evans. I go, oh, I, who, who? I don't know. Oh, and then I, I, take, I take the call. Uh, so I don't know who you are. He said, well, I'm interested. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, wh whatever. I'd come on Monday morning uh, at 10 o'clock, and I forgot all about it. <laughs> and uh, just I needed to get back into the disaster that was our technical <laughs> rehearsal. <laughs> and so then I, I'm going back for another coffee on the Monday morning, and, this, and I see this guy in front of me, and... Um, so I'm looking for Kenneth Branagh or whatever. And I go, oh, Christ, it's him. Oh, Jesus. This is like he's a nut. He's like a mad fan or something. There's some kind of, he just, he's a crazy person. I so I run back. So I don't tell him who I am. And I run back into the theatre and I say to David Parfum, I, that guy, I forgot about the guy going to see him. But don't let, don't bring him in for Christ's sake. And so I thought, phew, I thought, never do that again. Don't take the calls and just, I don't know this guy. So then I'm directing away, and they just come. I'm, I'm at the back of the stores, and I see them. Just David and, and uh, David now, Oscar-winning David Parfit. He 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 um, he is with Stephen down there, and, uh, and they come in and they go out. And I've hardly seen them. And, and then David comes back in, and I said, "Oh, thank God for that. Sorry to lumber you with that. I don't know who this guy is." And he shows me this piece of paper. I said, "What's that?" He said, "It's a check for ten thousand pounds." <laughs> I said, "You're joking." Because we were, we, were, we, we were already way behind. We were in, in debt for the next production that we were in. I said, and who's that? I said, for us. He's written it. He, that's it, ours now. I said, you're joking. 10,000 pounds. He said, yeah. And, and I told him about your crazy plan to direct Henry V, and he'd like to produce it. Where is he? Where is he? Bring, <laughs> bring him back. Bring him back. I, I just, I, let me buy you a coffee. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Take your calls and don't be as stupid as I was. But anyway, <laughs> thank God, persistent man who hung on uh, despite being uh, um, casually treated by my, oh, it's also too difficult kind of attitude. And so he, he, um, he decided that, uh, that uh, even though the conversation began, what do you want to do? I'd love to direct a film of Henry V. Really, how much have you directed? Uh, I haven't directed. He said, no, no, but how, how many actual films? I haven't directed any films. Uh, short, I haven't directed any short films. Um, <laughs> But you want to direct? Yes, I do. Um, and so, if that's those are the conversations I have late at night. Uh, I found after the play. <laughs> not that I recommend this. I'm not saying this, please. Uh, but I was a little bit drunk on those occasions. <laughs> um, enough to go. And then the camera would do this, you know. <laughs> and this, and then, you know, the kind of uh, whatever. Camera's on a crane. No, my arm's a crane, right? So the camera would do this. Uh, and I don't know, he, maybe I was just very careful about filling his glass at the same time. But he decided that he would, uh, he would go for it. And then we had this amazing sort of up and down journey of he pulled in favours and we were gonna have, it was going to happen. It wasn't. And David Putnam, Lord Putnam, Oscar winning David Putnam, was involved for a bit, uh, who produced Chariots of Fire, the movie. He was involved. And I remember him calling me in not long before it eventually happened. And uh, he said, I've got to tell you, uh, you should stop now. Uh, this film will collapse. It will mm. collapse either two weeks before or two weeks after principal photography begins. But that it will collapse is absolutely certain. And your career as an international film type, such as it might be, will be over. Will be over. So please take my advice. So we didn't take his advice. Um, <laughs> And he wrote the sweetest card when he saw the movie uh, about a year later, saying, well, you know, what did I know? Well, he knew a lot, and we were hanging on by the, by the seat of our pants. But somehow, Stephen, with incredible force of character and personality, uh, and David, both of them were the reasons that picture got made. 
Do you think that maybe your lack of directing film experience actually paid off in a way? Because uh, you thought you could do all these things? <laughs> well, I suppose, I mean, secretly, obviously, I woke up in the night and thought, what am I doing? <laughs> but I did feel, uh, I did feel, I, it was simple, unalloyed enthusiasm for the play and for its capacity to work in a different way from Olivier's classic as a movie. Just a feeling, I'd played it, uh, I'd played the character, I don't know, uh, over a hundred times with the Royal Shakespeare Company. I had a feel, feel, feel for the character such as, as it was, um, and I felt as though I was seeing that story in pictures and that I was able to uh, convey those pictures. And from the second job that I did, which was a Third job, sorry. Second television job I did, which was a film by a very fine director called Colin Gregg, an adaptation of Virginia Woolf's novel To the Lighthouse. And I played a character called Charles Tansley. So I was 21, and it was the first time on a sort of proper film-seeming set where, just as a matter of course, uh, I asked these guys what they were doing, as it were, and said, what, I mean, I asked the simple basic questions, what is this wheel, what, this, what is this guy doing at the side of the camera? He keeps, and he keeps using his tape measure, what's all that about? Well, that's a focus puller, and he's pulling focus, and that keeps you sharp, etc. I asked about what, you know, camera track was, and why they changed lenses, and uh, so I suppose from that point onwards, I had always, always been nosy about how it was being done. Um, and uh, the combination of those things, and a fantastic amount of ignorance. Ignorance and energy can get you a, a, long, a long way, I think. Um, uh, and all, it's, uh, Orson Welles once, once said that if you're going to make films, I suppose he had this experience with Citizen Kane, uh, it, you know, it is good to either have a complete knowledge or no knowledge at all. Um, and I suppose I was definitely on the, on the, on the other side of that. But I did... I, I had a very strong point of view, I suppose, even if it was to others must have seemed incredibly arrogant or, but for me, it was, I felt the same way about it as I'd felt way back when I just knew that I wanted to be an actor. So, it, it would, so there was something honest and pure about the intent, which was to tell the story. It was not, I must do this in order to become a famous person or whatever. I just wrapped up in making a film of Henry V. That's what it was. Which, I mean, obviously, if you want to become a famous Hollywood star, an adaptation of Henry V is the way to go. <laughs> so, were you surprised by how much it was embraced internationally? That, astonished, absolutely astonished. Uh, I knew that we'd had an amazing time doing it, and I have wonderful, wonderful memories of directing people like uh, Paul Schofield and just seeing all those people together. They were all, all there for the read-through. It was the only film I've ever done where every single actor was there for the read-through. Imagine what that crowd was like. That was a, that was a big room to play to. That was a, a fairly amazing experience. And, uh, and we, yeah, we didn't really know, we didn't know it was, really didn't even know at the time quite, quite how. I remember coming here to promote it and I met Whoopi Goldberg. I met Patrick Stewart very kindly introduced it one time when we were here in, at the beginning of 1990, um, just running up to the Academy Awards. Uh, or maybe it was even before that and before any of that had happened. Patrick I knew I'd worked with when I was a, a young actor. And I'd seen, in fact, that very production of Anthony and Cleopatra I alluded to had Patrick Stewart as a brilliant Ina Barbus. Um, and uh, so he, he introduced it here for a screening. Whoopi Goldberg was there. And we were talking afterwards. and. Uh, and she said, there was a little pause, she said, you have no idea what you guys have done, have you? You've no idea how much this picture means to us, you know. Um, uh, we shouldn't talk about America, but this particular group of uh, people. And, uh, and we didn't. We didn't um, accept that then and, and, and since, you know, one is always amazed um, and, and uh, impressed by it what really is doing the job in that instance, which is William Shakespeare, who simply, he's the one that is, that is the, the, the element in all of this that knocks people's socks off. But we were the lucky vessels through which his genius traveled on that particular occasion. And, and so we benefited from people rediscovering a magnificent piece of work uh, that we happened to interpret and get lucky with. And did Hollywood start come calling immediately after that? Did everybody want you for their movies? No, no. <laughs> uh, it never quite happens like that. I don't. I don't think. Uh, but it was. I mean, it was very, very exceptionally exciting. And um, uh, but it, what came? 
next was, was a, a film called Dead Again, which arrived, um, thank you very much, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, a, a, a script I remember with many fingerprints on it, that's how I, many, many, many people have turned it down uh, uh, because it's a sort of quirky, rather eccentric story about involving reincarnation. But I thought it was an excellent piece of writing and Scott Frank, who wrote it, has since written many very fine screenplays and has become a, a very good friend. Uh, was an exciting collaborator, as was uh, Lindsay Duran, who produced it. They were a very impressive pair, and I felt, um, uh, you know, that they would be they would they'd be wonderful to work with. And then I had the probably the the, fir <laughs> the first and only sort of conversation that I remember. Even then, I remember laughing about. It. As I, I had to have a moment. Yeah, you may not believe this, but I did have to have a moment where I had to persuade Paramount Pictures that it would be a good idea to cast Emma Thompson. Uh, in the part, the, the two double parts opposite me, which I think there was some suspicion of nepotism because we were then married. And I said, uh, I said, well, I can understand how you might feel that way, but nevertheless, I am here to tell you, regardless of what the future may bring, that at some point you will be on your knees to try and get a woman like this into your picture. So um, please cast her because she's a you know copper-bottomed star and a talent of the first rate and. Uh, uh, she ought to be in this and many other movies, so they, they were easily persuaded. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it, was that the first time that you had to do an American accent? Because you play uh, an American detective, and then you also play, obviously. It, I, yes, on film. I did one, uh, uh, I did it in a, in a drama school. We did a play co co called uh, No Orchids for Miss Blandish. I don't know if you know, there's a film, very violent film. But it, it's a it's a gangsterish story, um, and I played an American uh, Eddie Schultz in that, and I guess I pr started practicing then. And so when when it came to Dead Again, where I played this double part, an American detective, and then a, and a German um, uh, composer uh, uh, of of the f 40s uh, in the back in this sort of parallel um, story in the past. Uh, I, uh, in, in the run-up to the, the shooting, I would, uh, uh, at the weekends particularly, uh, go, go around L.A., you know, going to a restaurant or going to the pictures or whatever, uh, as an American. So I'd try out the accent and then was, was reminded about how so many people from here come from somewhere else, you know. So, so it was, uh, uh, you know, you'd try and do this accent to somebody who was selling you some popcorn and realize that, you know, they were from Austria or they were from somewhere else or whatever. But... Uh, uh, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed doing it very much. Yeah. And how do you direct yourself when you're appearing in a movie? Do you have someone who's like a second set of eyes for you? Yes, so Hugh Crutwell was that for, for many uh, many pictures. And then you know uh, Emma obviously knew me very well and uh, would not be shy and about saying stuff. And, nor, and I would expect that. And actually, one of the stranger things that surprises people is if you direct yourself in something, you know, you still uh, you know have a vulnerability. You got you know. Um, uh, you, you know, you, you have to have the appropriate thin skin sensitivity to be to be open and change, or at least I think so, from take to take. And actually, although, yes, you have the job, we do a scene together and then I step outside it when we say cut and I say, would you like to do it a bit more like this or this or have you, can you think about that? I have found that on the whole, most people give me notes back, you know, um, without being disrespectful or anything, you know, but, but it becomes a bit more of a collaborative thing. Um, I've also found that with, um, with directing myself in things that I've tended to rehearse a bit more and I've tended to have an actor uh, who will learn the entire part um, and who I can direct a bit as well, you know, in, 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 so that I can see it a bit, see the whole thing a little bit. Um, but it, uh, you just have to, yeah, you've got to listen, you know, you can't, you know, you've got to try and find the way to get some objectivity. And then in film, of course, you do have the ultimate luxury. You see it the next day, or as it used to be the next day, um, and then do it again if it's not up to snuff, which uh, sometimes it would not be. So, But it ends up being, you, you need as much help as you can get. Is it nice, though, because you can always rely on your lead actor to be there and not fight with you? <laughs> <laughs> I think that can be an advantage. Sometimes you get a bit, you know, obviously... Uh, as much as you put yourself in that position, which obviously must require, uh, you know, the appropriate amount of self-belief or ego or whatever it is or determination, uh, nevertheless, you have uh, moments of doubt and uh, uh, and and, and uh, you can be a little neurotic about it, like because that's part of who one is, um, and. You, 
but it's such an amazing, if you care about the detail of it as I do, then once you put yourself in that position, you've just got to get on with it, you know? Uh, I want to talk about some of the films you directed before coming mm. back to acting, although you acted in, in most of these. Um, and I want to start with Peter's Friends, just yeah. for no other reason than I love this movie. <laughs> um, and it introduced, I think, a lot of actors like Hugh Laurie and Stephen yeah. Fry and Imelda Staunton yeah. to uh, America. Yeah. And we hadn't seen them before. How did this project come about? What appealed to you about it? Um, well, uh I, I used to see them at our house a lot uh, because uh, Hugh Laurie, you may know, was at uh, university with Emma, and as was Stephen Fry, as was Tony Slattery, as was Martin Bergman, who was one of the co-writers of the film. And I was over here, I was doing post-production on Dead Again, I was uh, staying with Martin and Rita, and we were talking about uh, um, feeling that there was this sort of group of people who all had fairly variously interesting interconnected lives who were all going through sort of various life challenges or might be having the first child or might be having career things or might be just sort of um, you know brushing up against life in the way other people might recognize and, and uh, so that there was a kind of there was a, an ensemble story character study to be done there that we could maybe write specifically for them so um, Rita uh, Rudner, uh, Martin's uh, wife, a brilliant comedian in her own right. Um, uh, basically, we, we worked and we, everybody sort of threw their full penneth in and then those two went off and did it. And, uh, and it was nice. We knew, for instance, there's a lovely scene, I think, in it for Hugh where, because um, Imelda Staunton, a former Oscar nominee and, and brilliant actress of... Uh, on the bed? Uh, yeah. Well, well, there's a uh, there's a scene also for for, for Hugh when he's talk when he when he's talking about the twins that they might or might not have had, um, but it's just it's basically it's an interior moment of pain for him. I remember at the time we all knew that Hugh was a great actor, and the last person who knew it or believed it was Hugh, and uh, and so we wanted to give him this moment because we knew he'd do it wonderfully well, and he was quite tortured about it, which we teased him about. Um, but it was lovely to see that happen, and I think Stephen Fry is terrific in it. Emma's absolutely wonderful in it, and, and uh, it, it was it was it was very. Uh, it feels like it might be seem, and maybe it does, very sort of cliquey and sort of self congratulatory. But there's a lot of artistic Puritans in that group, so everybody wanted it to be good, and were, were good with each other. It's quite a robust group, you know. Uh, there's now there's one where people give you notes. I can tell you that if you're directing <laughs> it. Um, but uh, it was it was. It felt like it was a special, a special mm -hmm. piece, and I guess we couldn't but have been influenced by *The Big Chill*, which was a, uh, a, a Lawrence Kasdan film that I think is really terrific. Um, and uh, so it was, it was, it was, it was. I now look back on it with great fondness because, you know, everybody's done so well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it was interesting. I remember seeing it, and I had only seen Hugh Laurie in *Blackadder* up mm. to that point, and I was like, oh my god, this guy can act yeah. like. He can do drama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who knew? And he was, it was funny, the, the uh, Hugh's great hero, this is funny to think of this, Hugh's great hero is Clint Eastwood. Um, seems a bit weird, doesn't it? But I mean, <laughs> why shouldn't he be? Um, but it just seems unlikely, uh, uh, different kinds of individuals. But, but uh, I mean, he was sort of, I mean, really starstruck about Clint. And, uh, and as a kind of an end of term present, um, Emma, as somebody that Clint at that stage would not have known, wrote to Clint Eastwood and told him she'd got this friend. So Emma Thompson writes to Clint Eastwood to say, I've got this friend called Hugh Laurie, uh, who's such a huge fan of yours. Would you ever, could you possibly send a photograph? Which he did. So before either of them became, uh, uh, you know, sort of international stars, there they were having a little starstruck moment. And no one more pleased than uh, Hugh when he opened this framed photograph with... Uh, a signed uh, uh, picture from uh, Clint Eastwood. I think they, I, I think, has Emma worked with them? I think, or nearly did, or uh, Hugh might have done. They certainly have met subsequently, but it's nice to, it was a nice moment of remembering just uh, that kind of, the innocence of that. Did they just look up Clint and who's who of American actors? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that had to go to a magical, a magical place in Burbank. Uh, uh, I, think they were, I think Emma was smart enough to know where to write to. Uh, you also directed two, I, I guess I'd say, adaptations of classic works, Frankenstein and Sleuth. Mm -hmm. uh, with Frankenstein, what appealed to you about telling a new version of Mary Shelley's story? Um, I'd done so much work on Hamlet that it, the Frankenstein, the character, seemed a sort of a reverse of that coin where uh, uh, 
or a sort of parallel figure, I don't know how to describe it, where, where if Hamlet is about grief and, and the, amongst many other things, but if it's at least about grief and the difficulty that we face accepting loss, you know, if, if Hamlet's problem is his father died and, uh, and he does not feel that his mother has grieved long enough for his father, that there, has, there hasn't been this period, this ritual of mourning. And uh, I sometimes think the entire play of Hamlet would be completely redundant if Hamlet and Gertrude would just have had like half an hour, a cup of tea one morning to say, <laughs> wasn't it terrible, or had some memorial for him instead of coping with it in their different ways. But whereas Victor Frankenstein sort of defies death, simply says, mm. I, I, I won't have this. Um, and so that, 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 that defiance, that hubris of, of man against uh, what appears to be God's plan uh, at that point in, in, in human development, that sort of rage of, of man against uh, God and, and nature, uh, I found that very, um, as, as generations since it was written have done, uh, in, in, and in other versions of that myth, um, very, very compelling. And, um, and the, the whole experience was sort of a little mad, you know, because of a huge production and uh, being at the center of it and all the sets and everything, sort of getting into shape for it and kind of everything was sort of obsessive about it. I'd get up at five o'clock in the morning, I'd run to work, or at least I'd be, I'd be dropped about six miles from Shepparton Studios, I'd run the rest of the way and then I'd get made up and then I'd have to be there before anybody else. And then so I was a bit Frankensteinian as I did it, you know? Um, and. Uh, it was, I was, for me, it was a joy and a, and, um, a revelation to work with De Niro. Um, and as I say, uh, the other night, uh, uh, we had this scene where he, he's born and we ended up sort of semi-naked together in a, in a ton of KY jelly um, <laughs> wrestling. Uh, it seemed a strange way to get to know Robert, but uh, um, <laughs> probably be better than he, he would have wished. But... Uh, uh, but it was, it was fascinating to see him. One of the things I like doing, um, and it was a, such a treat then, it would, would be even more now, is, is whoever it is, uh, I, I like to just, I enjoy when, uh, I, I know I'm going to work with an actor, just reviewing their work. I mean, in the sense of just going back and seeing it again. So uh, rather like My Week with Marilyn, which involved watching everything Olivier had done, before working with Robert, I watched everything, everything that he'd done. And... Uh, that's like a sort of free, free class at film acting school or something. Um, and then to see him, see him do it and be so surprising, um, you know, with the two of us waiting to do a scene and the two lads playing uh, um, messengers who are going to come in and give some news to the professor. And, uh, and, and the, you know, it was a, obviously they were, they were, it was urgent news. And uh, so we were waiting to do it. The two guys are jumping up and down. They're doing press-ups and everything and, you know, getting out of breath. And, okay, ready to go? Oh, no, we just need two minutes. And then they do it again and everything. And him just, you know, looking bemused. <laughs> you know, and, like why they were going to all of this trouble. And, and him said, yeah, cool. um, well, you know, why, why are they doing that? Um, and I said, well, that's, well you, you're the reason they're doing that. It's because, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they think that now they, they, they're coming into a scene breathless, they're making themselves breathless. Uh, he said, you only need to do it when they say action. Um, which the boys heard and were completely astonished by because, you know, we assumed that, you know, the man who, you know, played Jake LaMotta and put on all that weight and everything was extreme to degree. But he was a combination of these things. And when, when, when we've spoken about, indeed you and I have spoken about the, the kind of difference, say, in, in My Week with Marilyn between the idea of the method and, and, uh, and something more traditional or classical, Robert, to me, was an interesting example of just whatever works for whatever scene and whatever part. So I'm sure on another occasion he might have made himself breathless or he might have done something. But he, he, I felt with him and what I kind of sensed with Olivier is uh, like Ulysses, they have a great deal of cunning as actors about how to best use their energies. And they don't necessarily, my experience of watching people like this, they don't necessarily have a single approach. Um, and so to watch him, you know, just do that particular performance was great to see, and I've, I've nicked lots of things since. He he would he loved having um, DPs don't, but he loved having many cameras running, you know, and sometimes having the wide shot being photographed at the same time as the close shot, which is difficult for sound and picture, but means that you've got a consistency of performance that you can cut to, and. Uh, 
you know, and he would do, he would repeat lines and things, and we would keep running, and we'd go back to the top of a scene, and we wouldn't cut and everything. And uh, he, you really felt a film artist who was working in the moment, you know, and full of uh, ideas and, 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 you know, sort of tricks, I suppose, to keep himself fresh. And, and so he was a remarkable person to learn from. I'm always curious about specifically people who work with De Niro and direct De Niro. Uh, do you ever have discussions where you're arguing a point with him because he's De Niro? I wouldn't argue with him. <laughs> <laughs> not, not expect to leave in one piece, I wouldn't. Uh... And have you ever been intimidated? You've worked with so many amazing actors. Lots. Plenty intimidated, yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, it's a way you look at it, isn't it? You think uh, you just... Just a little shift, as Hamlet says, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And um, so intimidation can be excitement, just like that, you know. Um, I remember uh, that very season of plays we spoke about where, where Judy Dench was um, directing, as if, oh yeah, I was just, yeah, I was 27, so I got Judy Dench to come and direct a play. I mean, I'd worked with her, but I was in awe of her. Uh, I think it was three days to work up the courage to make that telephone call. And I scripted the telephone call. <laughs> and I scripted it to be, to be naturalistic. You know, I can't remember what it was, but I literally got an A4 page. Hi, Judy, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm fine. Uh, just all of those kind of responses. You know, what, much, do you know much ado about nothing? Yeah, well, we were doing this, thing, whatever it was I came up with, but, and I'm like, my hands were shaking, you know. Uh, uh, John Gielgud, who I worked with a number of times, um, was, was somebody who, who it was just impossible to be in the same room and not feel, from, from, from that 16-year-old boy who got the idea from a teacher who perhaps was irresponsible that I could be an actor, <laughs> I then read everything about the theater I possibly could, and... Um, and was encyclopedic, actually, really, and then, not anymore, but in, 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 in my knowledge of, of uh, particularly the 60s, but much further back as well, I read biographies and theatrical magazines. And so when I would sit this close to John Gilgan, we're playing Romeo and Julia on the radio, and I'm playing Romeo, and he's being Father Lawrence, and I know that he's played Romeo to Lawrence Olivier's Mercutio, and, and I know that he was Alfred Hitchcock's secret agent, and I know that he was uh, Cassius in Joseph Mankiewicz's Julius Caesar with Brando, and I know that he was Arthur in, 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 in Arthur's butler in Arthur, and won his Oscar for that, and uh, that he worked with George Bernard Shaw, and his stage debut was in 1924 at the Old Vic <laughs> Theatre, and all of this stuff. I, you know, it's very hard to think of anything interesting to say um, because I also know this guy's played in front of uh, prime ministers and presidents and, uh, no, the, the, you know, the, the truth is, of course, once you start working with e even the most exalted of individuals, they're just human beings just like us and, you know, we know that that's true, but it's kind of exciting to be a bit awed by them as well. Then you get, of course, very inspired. You want to be good in the scene. I was always fine once we started acting together. Um, and of course, I just uh, I watched what he was doing, and, and his tech, his technical ability was great. What was amazing about him, though, for somebody who, who was perhaps associated with being a sort of very classical English um, Shakespearean actor of a certain kind that perhaps some people would dismiss as being rather technical, he was so real, so utterly, utterly, utterly natural. And uh, he and Brando got on like that when they did uh, Julius Caesar, and they spoke a lot about doing Shakespeare. Brando's a sensation in that movie, I think. And I think if Gilgood had an influence in that, uh, that, that I, I wouldn't be surprised. But uh, so it, it, it's daft to be intimidated because it's, you know, it's a beautiful thing that you're anywhere near such great talents. And, uh, uh, but yeah, you have to take a few deep breaths uh, from time to time, yeah. What about the intimidation of remaking something like Sleuth, which originally starred Michael Caine and, of course, Laurence Olivier? Yeah. Um, mm. What appealed to you about taking on that project? Harold Pinter's screenplay. Um, so I got to be in the same room as Harold Pinter um, and Michael Caine and Jude Law. And, uh, of course, the fact that Michael Caine wanted to be in it, a film that had been you know, multi-nominated, it was Mankiewicz's last film, and... and Michael's marvelous in the original, and Olivier is, you know, very, uh, you know, extraordinary. Um, but the fact that Michael wanted to do this very different take on it, this very sort of interior kind of uh, take, still a very theatrical idea, but um, a very sort of uh, different kind of 
take on it. And it also, it was a fun, I had a fun ex experience with uh, uh, Pinter, who, you know, fairly extraordinary individual, um, um, and who at that stage was, um, I don't know, he just won his Nobel Prize. So he won the Nobel Prize. I mean, not that he needed to win anything, but he just, he'd done a ton of wonderful writing, and uh, he'd done this thing. And uh, uh, Martin Schaefer, who runs Castle Rock over here, has been a great friend to me and to our work, and was one of the reasons we were able to make that full-length Hamlet, because of Castle Rock. They were, they were behind uh, Sleuth. And he'd said, as he'd said all the way through to, to Jude and, and, and everyone, and Harold, Quite honestly, he said, I wonder if there is anything to be thought about for the ending, if there's any additional twist. It's so wonderful, Harold. Um, do, I mean, you know, anyway, they'd had a development process where Harold had said no to that. And after a, a run through, we had a week of rehearsal where it was just brilliant to watch those two rehearsing. And we did a kind of run through for Harold. He was very ill at that point. So I was uh, wheeling him around. He was in a wheelchair and I was wheeling him around to be the camera. Uh, which was very intimidating for Michael Caine. So it was very, very intimidating. The first few minutes of that read through to, to you know, there's your Michael Caine and there's Jude Law and there's Harold Pinter <laughs> being and looking like that, like that. And I'm behind him, so the two of us are there. And I'm saying, we're just going to be where the camera is every time, Harold. Goes, oh, very good, very good, yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, but at the end of it, and I'd said to uh, Michael and uh, uh, to Jude, so do you, what do you feel about this ending? But do you think it's worth, should we try and have this conversation with Harold about possible change? We're not talking about throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but he's brilliant, it's brilliant. I'm sure, you know, he's got a bloody Nobel Prize. I'm sure he could, you know, maybe there's something even better. And Michael said, yeah, absolutely, right behind you. Jude said, yeah, absolutely, no, let's have that conversation. So then the four of us are sitting at a table after the read-through, this close. Uh, then Michael, Jude, Harold Pinter. Uh, da, da, da. What a read through. It went very well. Oh, thanks very much. Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. Harold, <coughs> I'm just wondering, and, and already I can see his eyes start to do that. Just wondering, oh, yes, just one. I mean, the, the end. What about the end? I'm just, we're just wondering. And now Michael and Jude are just doing this. <laughs> just doing this. And, uh, I said, it's, it's not just me, Michael and Jude, and now they're doing that. They're, they're, they're literally, actors. Um, uh, I said, look, uh, uh, I, I explained, you know, what the possibilities were. He said, I don't understand. I don't understand what you're talking about. And I thought, well, you do understand exactly what I'm talking about. So I went, then I was, then, it may, then I got a little bit, whatever. I thought, well, you may be Lord Pinter of Nobel Shire, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless, it's worth having a conversation. So we go through. He said, well, now I see what you mean. Here is what I have to say about the ending of the screenplay. I believe that in all of my works, across film, theater, and plays, across the 60 years of my career, that there has never been a more completely successful ending to a work of my art than the end of this screenplay <laughs> of Sleuth. Long pause, then I said, so you're not going to change it? I'm not going to change it! <laughs> he, <laughs> he did not rewrite, so. Um. Of course, I want to bring up a movie that just came out last year. You might have seemed like an unusual choice to direct Thor, yeah. uh, just because it's a comic adaptation. I actually find it very Shakespearean in many ways. Uh, who first approached you with that idea? Uh, my uh, uh, agent, Robert Newman, uh, with whom I just sort of signed, um, uh, had been full of you know sort of offbeat uh, ideas, and, and sort of I'd ask, listen, hey, I'm I'm interested to be uh, surprised and stimulated by uh, any kind of uh, different sorts of thoughts. I go and watch lots of different kinds of movies, so I'd be so I, I'm you know it, it's time for maybe thinking about uh, different kind of uh, directions. And so he, he sent a message one day saying, would you, would you ever think about directing Thor? And, uh, and I said immediately, yes, uh, because it was alone uh, amongst comic books, which are, I'm not a comic book uh, geek, but I absolutely knew Thor and well uh, from my time when I was a kid in Belfast. That's when I started being aware of it. And, um, and I was quite excited. It was, uh, that really was an unusual choice. And, uh, 
I like the combination of uh, how uh, primitive Thor is. I like the fact that he's an extremely strong individual, and uh, I like this, 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 this hammer, this sort of <laughs> blunt, rather brilliant uh, thing. <laughs> Um, and yet, turns out to be very. Uh, he, he turns out to be very virtuosic with it. Um, uh, and I like the fact also he's primitive, but but the story can travel across realms and you know through space. And so it has that sort of fantastical and, and pretty surreal and eccentric quality that I think is also fun. If you if you want to go if you want to go to the movies, I, I want to go to the movies and see things that I would not see on television, that I would not see in the theatre. I want to do. I want to see something in the cinema that really will be unique to and play to the strengths of that medium and those qualities in the story seem to me to have all of that but there was a spine uh, available to us which was this story of a young prince who needs to you know prove himself to be a sort of capable leader and 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 a and a, and a, a son who um, gains for what it's worth to him his father's approval uh, and set against a, a brother who, who who wants to try and do the same thing there was essentially a kind of a story about fathers and sons at the center of it that I thought anchored all of that. And uh, so I like the idea that, that it could have the ambition of a big popular movie and try and be uh, sensory, you know, give you big sound and big music and big effects, but also have at its heart uh, character and, um, and, you know, believability on, on the human scale. Um, I'm surprised by how much I love the movie, to be honest, because mm. I was not familiar with the comics. and. When I knew he had a magical hammer, like I wasn't sure what to expect. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I really love about the movie is the casting of Chris Hemsworth mm. and Tom Hiddleston. Mm. Uh, was there any pressure to use bigger names? What, how did they win those roles? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think uh, if, if we'd had more established actors, they prob possibly might have been a little older, and they'd certainly been more expensive, and uh, that that was a probably a, a factor. But I think that. Um, we, uh, the essential feeling was to was to find people, and find people who could uh, fulfil the sort of physical characteristics in in, in Chris's case, um, and to some extent in Tom's case, and who would be uh, would take it as seriously as we were taking it. You know, um, we wanted to have serious fun with it, but but certainly taking it uh, uh, seriously, and who would uh, work hard on the character side of it as well as the um, as all of the physical things. And they both, uh, they A, they had a very good natural rapport themselves as actors and happened to, happened to also as, 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 as people. Um, but they're both just very, very talented, very talented and, and, uh, and were, were sort of unafraid. I mean, a lot of people, it was quite a big, a big responsibility, particularly for Chris, to, to carry such a thing. And uh, I'm very proud of the pair of them, and they were a, a delight to work with. And I feel rather, they've both uh, been nominated uh, in next week's uh, BAFTAs uh, in the character of, uh, character in the category of <laughs> rising star. Um, and so, uh, uh, and Eddie Redmayne, in fact, who plays uh, uh, Colin Clark in My Week with Marilyn. So I feel rather sort of, sort of paternal pride in uh, my association <laughs> with them. Um, they're both tremendous. Tremendous actors. Who are they up against? Is it just the three of them? No, there's two other lads. Um, they're all ever so good. So, uh, you know, uh, thank God it's, we don't vote for it. It's voted for by magical people at BAFTA. So I, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't, because I, you know, I, I would be, uh, I'd get into trouble one way or another if I had to vote for them. Uh, for your acting career, how do you choose your roles? Well, sometimes I don't choose. <laughs> sometimes it depends what shows up. Um, uh, you know, you look for something that, um, you know, grabs your attention, and, and uh, I, I think we're all creatures who like to sort of surprise, and I, you hope that there's a variety in what you do. It's, it's, for instance, with My Week with Marilyn, the, obviously you can tell from this conversation that Laurence Olivier has had a huge influence on my <laughs> career and many others, uh, but just as I mentioned with De Niro, the idea of being able to uh, go back and look at his work, learn from it, and, and there was so much to absorb yourself in, so much to... Uh, you know, kind of get your teeth into as an actor. Um, but more, more and more, I, I, the, uh, the thing that I tried to enjoy doing, and I just finished doing some more uh, uh, films of, of the Swedish detective called Wallander. Uh, thank you very much, thank you. Um, which will there'll be, there'll be on Masterpiece this, uh, this coming July, I believe. Um, that's a character and a genre and a, and a kind of approach to the, in this case, a detective on, on television drama, 90 minutes, uh, 
where the demand for just truth, uh, unvarnished truth, uh, as little acting as possible is, is a real drive. And, and that, um, whatever the venue, whatever the part, whatever, that just, I don't, it seems such a silly thing to say, really. You know, oh, what, what I've become really interested in is trying to be real. Uh, but uh, it's just, I've noticed how difficult it is. Um, and what I love, I love watching acting that you can't see. And I guess what I've come to understand is that that's very difficult to do. And the people who do it are most impressive to me. And it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful when, when even if they're doing something big or there's an accent or there's something in between or there's, it's a very characterful performance, it's lovely to see invisible acting. Um, and that's, I guess, what I, I, I'm drawn to that to answer your question. Where, where can I try, where's the part where I can do the least? <laughs> Uh, it seems like you've played a lot of real life people in your mm. career, from Franklin Roosevelt uh, to Henry, Ernest Henry Shackleton to actually a couple of Nazis. Um, what's that about, actually? <laughs> it's a uniform. Um, uh, well, I, I, I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to know if there's a pattern, if there is any pattern to why you're drawn to certain things. But uh, that, that thing we are just talking about, actually, of, of that sort of... Um, it, invisible acting with something like uh, Conspiracy, a film in which I played uh, Hydra. Thank you very much. Thank you. In fact, I saw today Frank Pearson, who directed it, was at the, the, the nominees' luncheon today, former president of the Academy, indeed, uh, and uh, Oscar winning screenwriter himself. Um, and that, that uh, was su such a scary read, that, that screenplay, uh, such a sort of insidious account of how. 15 fellows around a table over a period of 90 minutes, real time, it was just 90 minutes, they decided that they would kill 11 million Jews. Just, you know, we've got chilling stuff to read. Uh, it was a great performance from Stanley, the, the great Stanley Tucci. Um, and I remember even what, it makes me, makes me give the shivers when I think of it now, he was sitting next to me at this table um, saying, just saying, and so we've, um, we have some land now, we've found, found a place, um, in Upper Silesia, it's called Auschwitz, and we can get, and, and he, the way it was sort of dropped in was so shocking, and uh, it was very, just on reading that screenplay, I, I thought that uh, that would be something, it was just, it was important, and it was uh, terrifying, and it was a difficult thing to do, because uh, uh, on all sorts of levels, for the, the subject matter itself was, was couldn't but be sort of harrowing if you watched it, and certainly if you were in it. And uh, and then the requirement to really try and do no acting at all was so total um, that uh, you know why Nazis? Well, in that case, it was just that was such a compelling, compelling story where uh, uh, it just. It could not not be done. That was one of those ones that came along and you thought, well, you have to do this. You've got to do this. Uh, speaking of real life people, that obviously brings us to my week with Marilyn mm -hmm. and Sir Laurence Olivier. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been compared to him a lot in your career, starting with Henry V. You both directed, adapted, starred in productions of Henry V and Hamlet. Did it almost seem inevitable you'd play him someday, or did you avoid it for that reason? I think the opposite. It was inevitable. You'd, in a way... The, the comparison thing, it's funny, in our country anyway, he was such a, uh, when you came into the, when I came into the business, uh, there was just, he was the name on everyone's lips as the actor. So my mum and dad uh, would, you know, that's who they think of as uh, the actor. And maybe in America at that time, they would have thought it was still Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando, when you talk about the great actor, it was Marlon Brando over here and Laurence Olivier over there. In the broadest terms, of course, they loved many, 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 many more actors than that, but but it was that simple. And um, and literally everybody was compared to Olivier. He did so much work, because he was a great film star, he was a great man of the theater, he'd done so many classical roles, that in England, if you pursued any kind of classical career, i.e. if you did Shakespeare plays or period plays, uh, then it just was, every review would start with, but for those who've seen Olivier, or for, but if you saw Olivier, or, and that would be absolutely the case. Every, it didn't matter who you were, and then I suppose if you didn't fail completely, you were then compared favorably. Uh, but this happened for the generation of actors that was Richard Burton and Peter O'Toole. It happened for the generation of actors that was Anthony Hopkins and Ian McKellen. And then because he was still dominating things, it happened for my generation and perhaps inevitably because of the simple fact of doing a film of Henry V that, 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 that he obviously had done 
spectacularly. Um, and so it just it couldn't be avoided, but it, you know, it wasn't something that you know, would, would stop you doing it because he, you know, a trillion productions of Henry V had happened since the play was written that just because of the nature of the film medium, there were never going to be that many film versions, but there will be another one. There'll be, and perhaps there'll be lots more, but be another one soon, perhaps. Uh, and so, uh, and, and, you know, people might get compared to ours and to his as well. Uh, that's just in the nature of things, I think. But um, uh, on the whole, you know, uh, one feels as though it's nice to sort of perhaps be at some points considered for who you are and what you've become. And so one never wanted to sort of go down that road again. But th this, this, this came along, and it was Simon Curtis, who's a great director and somebody I'd worked with before, David Parfit, um, you know, from way back, um, who was a producer, and Harvey Weinstein, who I'd worked with before. But most importantly, it was a very, very vivid account of uh, a great hero in difficulty and behind the scenes. And, uh, and it was an opportunity to talk a bit about the very things we've been talking about, this idea about acting. You know, he says in the film, as, as, as Paula Strasberg says, you know, Marilyn's only interested in truth, and he says that we're agreed on that, you know. Uh, I, I, we absolutely want truth, and if you can fake that, uh, you know, you'll have a great, a great career, uh, which is part of the paradox of, of, uh, of what we do. Even at our most committed to the truth, you've still got to show up somewhere. You know, there's still, you know, a kind of element of it that is not, that can't just be entirely spontaneous, or at least mostly that's the case. So th th things about the nature of art were there, but very subtly, I mean, because it's an easy watch, it's an easy read, and it, it appears on the surface to be a very sort of simple kind of movie. And I think it is, in a beautiful way. Simple's difficult. But it also has layers of meaning, I think, that are really attractive. And, and uh, to play him, as I say, was to go back and go back to college. And uh, in the end, it was just all too, all too irresistible. So uh, I, I essentially felt very honored. And then I also felt, without getting too sort of pretentious about it, that it was, in a strange way, it was a way of saying thank you very much um, for all that inspiration. Even the unflattering scenes. Well, I think you know, <laughs> no one is more candid about, about what happened than he is in his, own, uh, in his own Confessions of an Actor and the other book on acting and in other mater material interviews and things. He's very candid about how thrown he was by Marilyn, how sort of emasculated he felt. He felt he was not good in the movie. Um, he was, I mean, he, he might argue that he was a little indiscreet in how he spoke about it, but uh, no more indiscreet than we are in making a film about it. Um, uh, so he was, that was one of the reasons in the end one decided one could do it, because he'd written largely about it. And Anthony Hopkins, who, as you know, was in Thor, uh, uh, worked with Olivier on uh, Mutant and the Bounty in, uh, I think, 83 or 84. And they had, he said they got very drunk the night be together the night before uh, Olivier's scenes. Uh, and Olivier was still banging on about Marilyn then, still <laughs> completely. Couldn't still, let go. Well, he couldn't quite, I guess he was still trying to work out why it didn't work. You know, he was still perplexed by what, in theory, could or should have been a sort of tremendous uh, collaboration. She was the biggest movie star in the world. He was the sort of greatest actor. She was, uh, she was happily married just recently to Arthur Miller. It was her own production company. It was a great opportunity for him. It should all have been terrific, and it was a disaster you know, <laughs> for them. Why do you think it didn't work? I think, um, I, I don't know. And I don't, the, the film sort of tries to look at possible reasons why. Uh, I think it was tough for him, if, if I'm correct, to have her as his boss, for her not to show up on time. I think that he felt that that was the basic requirement, was that you, you could kind of be difficult or temperamental. He was used to all of that. He was married to Vivian Lee. They were having a very tough time. So he knew about you know, difficult artists. He was one himself. But I guess he just couldn't handle the lateness. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's as simple as that, because uh, I think he took it personally. He found it disrespectful. Um, I think he found, uh, you know, I think he wanted her to fall in love with him. He thought, I'm 50 years old, but rather beautiful, and, you know. And of, course, and of course, he was 50 years old and rather beautiful, but, uh, but she was Marilyn Monroe and just married. So it was, you know, it was less likely to happen than perhaps he, he thought. Um, so I think there was quite a bit of personal stuff. Mm -hmm. It wove its way into it. And then I think he possibly realized, gosh, on film, 
she is walking away with this um, and that all his experience of playing that role in the theater um, had left him perhaps by contrast with her naturalism. It's still a heightened style. I mean, the piece is still very theatrical in its way. It's not, it's not normal people talking you know, across a kitchen table, as it were. So it's still very heightened. She's Elsie Marina from the Coconut Review. Um, but she still manages in a heightened style to be so wonderfully uh, simple. And he's got his accent and he's got the, I think you feel as though maybe he's playing for some laughs that he got in the theater that I don't think work as spontaneously. Then I think it's the problem which I, I'm aware can be an issue of when you're, if you're directing somebody who's challenging in a two-handed scene and you're directing and you're trying to give them of your best, then potentially your performance is, gonna, uh, is maybe going to, if not suffer, it's going to be affected by it. And I think that that might have been the case with him as well. Now, you never got to meet Olivier, but mm. you have worked with and are friends with many people who yeah. did work with him. Yeah. Did they, was there any insight you gleaned from that? They talked about, I mean, Tony Hopkins and Derek Jacobi both talked about how Olivier could, would be all things to all people. You know, he was many characters in a day. Um, he would be the, you know, your genial host. He would be, you know, the serious academic type, although he, in, in, in truth, everyone says he wasn't very academic, but he was sort of brilliantly, intuitively smart. He could be very sort of bitchy and camp. He could be, uh, um, and, he could, and he could be rather grand and, you know, sort of uh, representing the British theatre. He was a bit, of, a bit of everything. Gilgood said this about him, that you never quite knew who you were getting. Um, but he was, so he was, everything was a kind of performance, brilliant performance, but, but uh, you didn't quite know who, who, who he was, was the impression that they gave. But uh, both Hopkins and Jacoby both said, as a leader in the National Theatre, where they were all there with uh, Ian McKellen and, and you know, Albert Finney and Maggie Smith, that he was quite wonderful, you know, really an inspiring inspiring figure and if you just look at his industry the and that group of actors that he developed at the National Theatre in the 60s was really a very sterling group of people he knew you know he knew uh, talent when he saw it yeah. didn't Hopkins and Jacoby do Othello with him uh, they well no Jacoby Derek was in it and uh, Hopkins might have been in it walking walking on um, Michael Gambon was in that uh, Othello and that was uh, Famously, where Olivier apparently did some uh, in what was already a celebrated performance, he did a particularly spellbinding performance one one particular evening. It was apparently amazing, and uh, so much so, so unusually so, even for his even by his high standards, that as he walked off, all of the actors, this included Maggie Smith and Derek Jacobi and Frank Finley, spontaneously applauded him as he left the stage. But as he did so, he he looked thunderous. He looked so angry, and he stormed past them. And he slammed his dressing room door, and Derek was the one assigned to go up and nervously <laughs> knock on the uh, on the dressing room door and say, "Sir uh, so Lawrence, we just I, I don't uh, you seem upset, sir. We we just I mean you of course are wonderful in the role, but tonight, sir, you transcended. It was one of the greatest things any of us have ever witnessed. Tonight, you 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 were, if I may humbly say so, truly great." To which he replied, "Yes, I know." And I'm so angry because I don't know how I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, it's quite indicative, isn't it, of the, this, uh, he, he, was, uh, he was this master technician. That's what I, the point I was making about sort of Robert De Niro earlier on, is that, is that um, you know, the greats, even someone like Olivia, who might, who might have, and in his relationship with Marilyn, might have sort of been insistent on the idea that you showed up and you were mechanical and it was about technique and everything. He was capable of, because he was a great artist, this inspiration. And that, that seemed to be a night on which little did he know, you know, the muse had been with him in addition to all the hard work and in addition to all the brilliant technique. He had flown, it had sung, the part had played him. And of course, if the part plays you in Shakespeare, Jesus, I mean, you, it will be transcendent. Because, I mean, if you, if you somehow let go in Hamlet, and I've had that experience where that thing is happening. You're, you just, you're there, it's coming through you. It's like meditation. It's like sort of being at one with the universe. When Hamlet's on song and you happen to be saying the words, it's a, it's a mystical experience, both for you and for the audience. And I think, uh, I think he had that and, and, uh, 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 more than once. But on that particular night, it's funny that he should be so cross that he, that he couldn't put it in a box and say, that's, what I, that's how I'll do it again. 
Uh, in a way, I guess you've been sort of preparing to play this role your entire life. Uh, did you have an existing Olivier impersonation? And what other research did you do? <laughs> I, uh, I, it wasn't really impersonation. I, I, I often did, would just do impersonations of other people who did impersonations of him. But I remember t <laughs> two, two um, accounts of, of a, you know, um, meeting his voice for the first time when I was uh, sort of 15, 16 and doing Shakespeare and, and, uh, at school and then being introduced to the idea of being an actor. There was a, a, an LP record, long playing record, uh, of the speeches from the Shakespeare films of Laurence Olivier. Um, and there was also another one of John Gielgud performing The Ages of Man, a, a concert version of speeches from Shakespeare. So I, rem I asked to borrow those. These were very un unused in the English uh, uh, stockroom <laughs> cupboard. Clearly, you know, they hadn't been used in the teaching world or by any student. For so they didn't mind. I took them home. And, I, and so that's the first time I think I consciously heard. So I would the, the, my first memory of Olivier, in a way, was just the kind of creaking of this little <laughs> <laughs> of the record going round and then to be or not to be that is the question and so it went on it was just uh, <laughs> and then the, the, other, the other way I heard Olivier at that time was um, on a variety show on a Sunday night on, on English television Peter Sellers this was how sort of famous as the actor Olivier was Peter Sellers doing an impersonation of Olivier as Richard III, <laughs> performing in the voice of and in the style of Olivier's performance as Richard III, a Beatles song. <laughs> so he was there doing, it's been a hard day's night. <laughs> and I've been working like a dog. <laughs> and he went on through the whole of, the, the, the whole of that... Uh, Number, but it was, uh, and he looked very like him. He sounded very like him. Actually, but so, so, and then everybody else in our profession would do. Uh, Anthony Hopkins does a wonderful uh, Olivier impersonation, and uh, uh, but anyway, in, in this case, when we were with Marilyn, you were just trying to find, uh, uh, particularly that sort of uh, that sort of thing that he does. With, where he's kind of he's all a, it's all one kind of wiggle, you know, where <laughs> it's a kind of. Uh, where it's, it's just about seduction. I mean, he said famously, a little more graphically than this, that, uh, that when you go on stage, you should make every single member of that audience want to uh, uh, do things to you, uh, uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, male or female. And, and, um, and so he, there was a kind of thing about him that was often comically frustrated in this process with Marilyn, where he saw himself as and indeed it effectively was, in many cases in life, the great seducer. And uh, rather like, uh, I've noticed when meeting very powerful people, that one of the things they do always is drop their voice. They always make you lean forward, whether it's royalty or, or politicians, you know, in private. And I think Olivia used to do that. Also, it sort of, it would sort of affect this kind of list he didn't really have a list, but he sort of put it in anyway. <laughs> and also, if you watch him in interview, the hand sort of keeps doing that. And he also he, he rolled his uh, tongue around. <laughs> I know they think a little bit, kind of, you know. It's a, t it's a bit, it's pretty camp as well, you know. And that sort of, um, because he knows he can't do that. Uh, he's, you know, and he's got all of those... Uh, big colors and a big voice and Othello's down there and everything, that the sort of, Olivier in interview, which is, there's a great interview with him and Kenneth Tynan with Olivier, just called On Acting, uh, where it's, as, it's like a sort of kitten trying to seduce the interviewer. And he's always <laughs> sort of touching things and trying to be, and also affect a sort of voice that sort of starts to kind of, uh, <laughs> break things up and sort of go a little bit babyish. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. <laughs> uh, as you could tell, I had hours of mindless fun doing this, you know. Uh, it's a funny, you know, the, the, well, there's a marvellous uh, documentary about him by Melvin Bragg, great British um, documentary maker, did the South Bank show, you've probably seen many accounts, did 25 years of the South Bank show, and they did two um, 
great hours, or maybe it was more than that, two two-hour versions of, of Olivier's life in, in which Olivier is interviewed throughout. And, but he was so, um, you're asking, you know, what did, what did people who knew him think he was like? And he just had a, a sort of sense of the theatrical. And, and at the end of that uh, four hours of uh, detailed account of this extraordinary, rich, packed life, and you just had this sense of him, which we try and get in my week with Marilyn. I've sort of, he, he kind of performs his life for you and he knows how to finish it off. He's got a great sense of the theatrical. He knows, you know, what's a beginning and a middle and an end and how to get to the kind of third act climax and then come down and then get ready for the fifth act. And he's just got a simple line at the end of it. He's in his garden at the end talking to Melvin Bragg. And uh, he says, um, I've, I've got a wonderful family beautiful children. They're very kind to me. I feel very petted. I remember the just unusual <laughs> choice of word, you know, um, <laughs> petted. And also he hits the T's in the middle and the D's at the end. So I feel very petted. Um, and then there's a long pause and then he just looks away. Sort of tragic, like a character in a Chekhov play. <laughs> uh, the four hours of television, he knows it's the end. He knows he's got to come up with something. And he could do a big finish, or he can do the, or he can do go out on the sort of minor note. And he looks away and he goes, uh, It's a funny old kind of a day, isn't it? That's it. That's how he goes. Like, it's, a, it's a funny old kind of a day, isn't it? And again, he's back to being a little cat with a cream. And you go, Great! Oh, wonderful! It's just, he's, it's just uh, uh, sort of a wonderful, outrageous, magnetic thing. Uh, I have a question from the audience, um, from Avery Maddox. Uh, what did you discover about yourself in playing the role of Sir Lawrence Olivier? I, uh, there's one scene in it where uh, it was a sort of semi-improvised, where she, uh, Michelle comes in and she, she has the, uh, she's got to remember something from the, um, she has to come in and say, gee, this is all right too. And, um, repeatedly she says, gee, this is all right. He says, it's two. Gee, this is all right. No, it's gee, this is all right, too. And it sort of brings out the sort of, um, whatever you might call it, the pedant in him, or just that's his choice, to be accurate. And it was semi-improvised. I suppose I was slightly appalled at uh, my <laughs> the way I was able to kind of make up the sort of stuff directors say when you're trying to get an actor to do something they don't really want to do, or or when frankly you're you're just flailing around and you know you're using every trick in the book not that you necessarily know what that is but you were but you're going close to them and far away you're trying to be whispery you move it in and you, you know when inside inside everything's saying this is terrible this is dreadful there's no time it's so bad it's so bad she's so awful it's so bad that was terrific <laughs> that was terrific it was because you know I, I you know praise you just I the honey rather than vinegar is what uh, I think is the way to go. Now, when I say all that inner frustration, y you don't have you don't have real perspective on that because if you're directing something, the clock is ticking. Other people are doing stuff, uh, and and just sometimes, uh, I, I guess, you know, I, I, if I didn't feel his pain, I kind of knew sometimes it's one of the great frustrations, particularly if you are an actor who directs. One of the great frustrations is when you can't find the way to talk to the actor. Mm. Or, if you aren't clever enough, which I often have not been clever enough, to just shut up and be patient. I, I found the, the biggest lesson that I continue to try and learn about directing is say less, listen more, and get out of their way, get out of your way. And don't feel that pressure to have great thoughts or great insights. Directing is really just, a, it's about move, it's not giving it necessarily to the actors. You come along and then I point somewhere or direct it a little bit, you know, we do it together. It's taken me a long time to sort of, sort of un understand that rather than getting pointlessly frustrated that they're not doing it the way you might do it or whatever. And so I suppose I, I recognize some of my own ridiculous frustrations in, in, in a scene like that. Uh, another audience question from Olivia J. Fox. Uh, well, you actually kind of addressed this, but uh, in the film, uh, Olivier says directing is the best job. Do you agree? And without naming names, have you ever had to deal with a difficult actor or actress? Go ahead and name names if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did. You know, he did repeatedly say that he thought directing was the was the best job in the world. 
but he was also uh, he was impatient about it. He didn't want to wait to do it. You know, he didn't make another film as a director after um, The Prince and the Showgirl until, indeed, his own film of uh, Three Sisters, where, indeed, he played uh, Chevy Tekin very, very beautifully. Uh, and I guess, uh, I mean, it's, it, is a, it is an amazing job, uh, I must say. I, I, yeah, I had one experience of, I, I, I suppose, to touch on what we were just referring to, where I just, I had what I would call a tricky actor um, in as much as, uh, well, you know, they were very talented, no question about that, but um, they were used to working in a different way. You know, sometimes people just play a few games and, you know, you've got to do a lot of guessing about, so they said black, but really they mean white, but, uh, <laughs> you know, they said something and they meant something else. And, and I, basically my, my feeling about the atmosphere on a set or in a rehearsal room is that I, basically my experience is that it's better if there is relative harmony. So I am utterly unfit for sort of the games playing because I'm not any good at it I'm not I can't you know I, I get surprised when people didn't say what they meant they meant something else and I had to there need to be some code you know uh, so uh, so I really am flummoxed then I'm baffled uh, um, so for instance I'll say to actors early on in, in like in, a, in preparing for a film I'd say you know um, I mean, if it applies, I mean, uh, I, I'd say, look, um, if there is a, an angle of your face that you really don't like, if you think, I don't, but if you think you have a weirdly shaped earlobe and you never want me to shoot the right hand side of your face, then I simply won't. Um, you know, so tell me about it. Or I'll say, listen, here's why it should be, and I'm going to show you on somebody else's earlobe how I'm going to light it and see if you think. In fact, I'll even shoot yours and show you, and you can tell me. What I don't want is you to be unhappy, but what I mostly don't want is one day to be wanting to shoot that, and you tell me you feel really bad about the line in the scene at the end where she says whatever, and really, it's only about your right earlobe. <laughs> because that's... And I've, been, I've been in that situation where I go, what the fuck? I'm just, it's hours of just... You know, and, re and it's only about shoot me from the other side, you know. That's okay. Vanity's okay. These are normal things. I want you to look your best. I want you to feel your best, you know. So, so that's okay. And then maybe some point where I say, well, you want to look like that, but it really requires this. Is there a way to talk about that? But we can talk about it because nobody else is listening. And actually, you could, have that, you could really have that very quietly in my ear. Or you can say it to somebody else who's, you know, like a DP or something. But we can... You know, we can, you know, we can do it together, as it were. I want you to be the best you can be. And then I'm excited. You know, I'm excited about when actors are released like that, uh, when they're, they're really, when they're often working at their best. As an, as an actor directing, I find that it's just a high, high, high level of job satisfaction to watch talented people doing what they do well particularly as, as you've heard me banging on about how, uh, how interesting I find it to, for people to do invisible acting. So I'm in awe of it. I'm in, I'm in awe of it when I see people do it. Therefore, when I find a tricky actor who um, may be either needing some kind of conflict that I do understand and I respect is a way, whether conscious or not, of working. It's just not my way and I'm not great at responding to it, but I'll put up with it, you know, I mean, it's just, it just, you know, it's just a way of doing it. But I've never found it to ultimately be better in terms of results, sheer results. Does the person who is tricky, who, uh, for me, they'll get like a seven or an eight on a scale of one to ten, and if you had that with harmony, and I don't, when I say harmony, I don't mean everybody brings in cookies every day and it's all <laughs> hugs and everything. That still includes shouting and passion and temperament and storming out the door. I don't care if you do that. If you care, I'll know. I'll know whether you care about it or whether you're pulling a fast one and doing some kind of, you know, kind of uh, weird thing, you know. So passion, temper, it's all fine. That's all fine. I can cope with that and I give as good as I get and I want people to be good but, but uh, the, you know, the sort of little, I don't know, it comes out of insecurity, comes out of fear or whatever and it completely throws me and in the particular instance I'm thinking of, the ultimate result was the performance wasn't as good as she could have been or I could have directed it and ultimately it was, I, I must say, it was my, I didn't find a way of dealing with it. I didn't find a way of being able to talk about it or discuss it with her. I just, I found myself uh, rather like Olivier in this rather unmanned, just felt rather wimpish and stupid. So uh, anyway, I got over it. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hmm, now I have some guesses yeah. in mind. You'll never get it. You'll never get it. You'll never get it. Uh, actually, this question doesn't have a uh, name on it, but wants to know what you think Olivier would have thought about your performance. 
Uh, I have absolutely no idea. I know that um, when, when Derek Jacobi uh, played uh, Oedipus and Mr. Puff in Sheridan's The Critic, a double bill of roles in a single evening that Olivier had made famous in, in, uh, in the early 40s, where his famous cry as Oedipus when he's blinded at the end of the play was one that uh, apparently sent chills down the spine of the reviewers and people asked Olivier where had this sound come from, this incredible sound that he'd made, ear-piercing sound, and he said that he had once heard a mink trapped in a, in a trap dying and that what he had recreated at the end for Oedipus's cry of pain as he's blinded was the sound of the mink being caught in the trap. And for Mr. Puff in The Critic, uh, an incredible um, uh, opposition to that kind of role where he's funny and camp and it's high comedy and all the rest of it. Um, and somebody asked him why he'd done those two parts together. Uh, and he said, I just wanted to show off. Uh, he said, simple vulgarity. I wanted to show off. Anyway, that was 1941 or something, and nobody ever done these two parts again. They'd never done them together. Olivier had simply said, you'll never do them again. They've been done definitively. No one ever plays Mr. Puff in The Critic and Oedipus in the same evening. It doesn't happen because I've done it, and I've taken it off the board, as it were. In 1972, Derek Jacobi leaves the National Theatre Company, and his first job away from the National Theatre, where he's been there for eight years, uh, played uh, Cassio in Othello and, and then a whole ton of parts, was a great star in the National Theatre. He goes to the Birmingham Repertory Theatre and his first job is to play a double bill of Mr. Puff in The Critic and Oedipus. First time it's been done since Olivier did it. And on the first night, the telegram from Olivier arrived at Derek Jacobi's <coughs> dressing room with two words which were, cheeky bugger. <laughs> 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 so... I suspect at the very least I'd be getting the cheeky bugger remark. Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for, I know how busy you are, for coming out tonight. Oh, thank uh, you. Thank you guys for being such a great audience, and congratulations on everything. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks very much.